test to see if whether uh, this voice is going to hold up for a period of time, but uh, been looking forward to it. We're going to see. We're going to go forward. Uh, still struggling with one or two things, but uh, I want to give a shout out and a thank you to John uh, Schmidt for his message yesterday and for filling in. Uh, looking forward to get to knowing him a little better. I asked him, uh, we talk about educational background and things, and he got a seminary through Luther Rice Seminary, which is where I started in my seminary education. So uh, we had a few things in common, so we just had a uh, really good time of, of visiting. So I was glad he was there, glad you guys got a chance to meet him. Uh, and uh, you'll hear a good word from him, and it really was, and I want to thank him very much for that. So it is good to see you all this morning. If I sound a little raspy, a little hoarse, you know, that's you know, kind of the normal way my voice sounds in the morning like this. But uh, we are here. I want to give a shout out to Ruth and to Kenneth this morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Good to be back with you, Lena and, uh, and, and Rick. We love you guys. Uh, haven't heard an update on your daughter, so I'd like to hear. Been praying for her. Uh, and and uh, 
I know your hands have been full, but uh, we love you guys. Uh, let us know how she's doing, okay? Angel, it is so good to see you, and I'm assuming sweet uh, Thena is out there as well. Big hug uh, to both of you. Debbie, it is so nice to see you this morning. Let the hearts see. It is good. Good morning. It, I, I bet it was really nice to be in there uh, uh, yesterday morning. Uh, it looked like they had a good time anyway. Brenda, uh, Brent, bless you. God bless you. And I hear, Brent, that uh, things are going well with the nativity. And then Sherry is telling me all about it. So uh, thank you. Thank you for your, your labors. Appreciate that. Daniel, good morning to you, my friend. Be careful at work. Don't get yourself hurt. It's good to see you. Your whole family's out there, my friend. And there's Alyssa with my, I'm hoping, my Cameron, Karen, Cody. You guys had a good rafting trip. Hope the baseball game went well yesterday. Good morning. We missed you all. Uh, but we're, we're back. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad you had a great time. I really am. Miss Carolyn, uh, love you, my sister. It's good to see you. Glad you're feeling better and looking a little stronger. Uh, I am. I still struggling with some things in the voice. But, uh, you know, uh, we'll just see how things, you know, work along. Still working with the doctors and stuff. But uh, uh, this will be a good test this week, I think. Uh, uh, Angel, she just woke up. Yay! Give a big kiss. Right here. Right here. Okay. And there is Miss Carrie. God bless you, Miss Carrie. It's good to see you this morning. And a joy to pray for you. And a thank you for all your prayers. She has been doing better. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. She will see her surgeon on Wednesday. Uh, tubes are still leaking, but it's good to, to hear that she's doing better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lena. All right, we're going to jump back in here. It's been a week, and, and I appreciate all the, the comments on First John. I enjoyed going back and listening with them and thinking, oh, what would I do differently? And uh, what have you shown me since we, we taught that? And uh, I think I could go back and teach First John again and maybe learn something from it. But uh, 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 it's been a great uh, backup study when I've been off or been, been uh, incapacitated, as it were. And I appreciate uh, the insights and uh, the uh, involvement each of you have had uh, during that time. Uh, so, uh, you know, God is good. We have been looking at the fourth chapter of Acts. That's uh, where we kind of got stopped. It was that time where uh, Peter and John and the light man's brought more forward the Sanhedrin, if you remember, and uh, they recognize a great miracle has taken place, and that had to have been hard uh, for the Sadducees for uh, uh, that branch because they didn't believe in miracles. But it's pretty hard to deny what was right before their very eyes. Well, uh, they uh, bring them back and they warn them not to teach in the name of Jesus anymore. And of course, Peter's great statement, Peter and John, as they said, uh, you determine whether it's right that we listen to you or to God. As for us, we cannot stop preaching, teaching what we have seen and what we have heard. And then they release them and they go back to uh, the church. And immediately the church starts floating a petition and uh, appealing, no, we know they didn't do that, did they? Immediately they went to prayer and they, they began to pray, you know, and, and, and pray through scripture, applying scripture to the, the situation that they found themselves in. And uh, uh, it's a great, beautiful prayer. We're not gonna look at that. We've been looking at it, uh, but we are gonna move you know, forward in that uh, this morning. And we will begin uh, this morning uh, uh, with what happens after they pray. You know, the awesome, awesome presence of God in that, uh, oh, what a precious thought. The awesome presence of God. Remember the video clip that I played uh, from Revival uh, in the Hebrides Islands. And as Duncan Campbell was explaining it, he, and he uses that term as they step out and how the Spirit of God was moving across the Isle of Lewis. Uh, and they said, 
God stepped down. Folks, when God steps into a situation, you know it. And uh, I've been in situations where it just felt like God just stepped down and moved in. And the presence of God was so incredibly real and so incredibly strong that people would fall under deep conviction and cry out to God. Ah, what a blessing when God steps down. Let's pray and get started this morning. Father, I want to thank you for the joy that we have of coming together this morning. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you will sustain me and that, Lord, you will open up your word to each and every one of us. And I pray, Lord, that it jumps off the pages or we jump into the pages and they become so vibrant and alive and real to us, Lord, that your truths just saturate and permeate our life. God will love you. I thank you that, uh, uh, that uh, Lena and Rick's daughter, Colleen, is doing better. God, we just pray your hand to be laid upon her in a very special and a wonderful way. We thank you that Cynthia, though she has her up days and down days, you know, Lord, that uh, she plugs in and she's with us whenever she can. We thank you for that. Thank you that uh, Ryan was been able to be in service the last couple of weeks. What a blessing, you know, that is, as he takes the bus all the way over just to be with us. God, thank you This is family who has sought to reach out, not only where we live here, but reach out through prayer and through their generous giving to touch folks all around them and across the world. Thank you for the way you've spread your word through this very simple ministry, Father. We love you. God, I'm just asking you, oh, we need you to step down in our day. Bless us now, Lord, as we go into your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Uh, one of Luke's goals in his Acts narrative is to explain to people that what they long for, hunger for, cannot be found in a plethora of false gods. It can't be found in human effort. It can't be found through human potential. It can't be found in uh, the accumulation of the things of this world. It just can't. His purpose is to show us that there's only one place that it can be found. And that's in the presence of Almighty God, as the psalmist says, that there is pleasure, uh, multitudes in the presence of God. A society, uh, a, a community, if you will, who experiences true, to use the Greek word, koinonia, true fellowship, can only come about through fellowship with the one true God, through his son, Jesus Christ, and through the ministry of the Holy Spirit working in and through the lives of his people. That's body life. That's the Spirit of God working. We've talked about how God speaks. He speaks to us uh, through nature. Everything that uh, we need to know about God is out there, isn't it, in uh, general revelation? in the things that he has created so that we would be left without any doubt that God is real and God is. Romans 1 tells us that. God speaks to us in specific revelation through his word, specifically through his son Jesus, who is his final word, if you will, to man. But we also say, tell, he speaks through others. He speaks through the body. He speaks through believers. And uh, if I truly believe that, then occasionally 
I will listen, not, not, not listen, folks, when we're talking about that. We're not talking about listening, you know, to anybody who claims or calls himself to believe the illegal. We're talking about listening to and, and, and hearing God from people who have a closer and intimate walk with him and, and through the body. Uh, last week, I started receiving phone calls, text messages, emails, encouraging me to stay away one more week, rest up, get over. Uh, in fact, had it been one voice or so, you know, I might have been easily able to put that off and explain it, but there was such a plethora of voices speaking to me as one voice. Now, unless you guys got together and had some sort of meeting and say, okay, you do it this day at this hour, and you do it at this day at this hour, and uh, you know, you all teamed up in some sort of conspiracy, uh, it couldn't be explained by, uh, unless you did it that way, any other means. Because it was like one voice was raising through a multitude of people, through uh, many, many of you speaking the same word, you know, to me. Well, you know, when that happens, it, I would be a fool. I appreciate the way Buck put it. You know, when he said uh, the 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 smart mic or the wise mic, whatever. I mean, you know, listen. But you know, I I sought to listen to what God was saying. And though it's not easy to stay out of the pulpit, it's not easy not to preach or to teach for me. Uh, God had what he had for us through John, and he blessed, and I did have that extra day of rest. And we will see today when I finish teaching, I'm going to rest my voice. I'll work, but I'm going to rest up. I still got to call into the doctor, that kind of thing. But thank you all for those words. There's my Miss Sweet Sherry. Good morning, brother and sister. We're grateful for your love and prayers. Miss Linda, God bless you. Good morning to you and your precious husband. Miss Betsy, I love you from Jess, Sadie, uh, Sadie May. Yes, too. I miss seeing you guys. Didn't get my, my, my Sadie hug, but uh, that's okay. I love you, love you. Uh, big hugs and squeezes. Miss Therese, my bonnet gal, good morning to you. Thank you all for loving me and loving my family. I appreciate that. Well, in in this narrative, as we get there, one of the one of the things that we see is uh, you know a a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. The pressure was on the church now to become inward focus. You know, we ever say this several times. The uh, uh, the pressure from the outside for the church to conform, right? Listen, from the very beginning, they weren't eliminating the church. They were just saying, conform to our standards. Do it our way. They, they didn't mind the meetings as a church. Just keep it to yourself. Religion is best kept. You know, here in your mind and your heart. Keep it to yourself. Don't take it public, right? Now, wasn't that the pressure? Because they didn't, they, they told them to stop teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus. But they weren't at that point in an all out war against the church as long as they just kept it quiet. So the pressure has always been on the church to become inward focused. In essence, the ruling council told them to go away and tend to their own business and keep it to themselves. Now, they'd have been saved if they simply kept their newfound faith to themselves and last allowed the status quo to remain the status quo. <laughs> that, too, is the pattern we see through Luke's narrative as well as through the entirety of the church history. As long as you keep your faith to yourself, 
you can get along in this world without any opposition. You're safe. Believe what you want to believe. If it doesn't line up with societal norms, then just keep it to yourself. The church belongs behind the walls of the building, right? Isn't that the pressure that we have? And we face that same temptation today. The pressure is constantly exerted against the church to become inward focused and not outward focused. Isn't that true? Israel. Let's just take a picture of Israel. When God set Israel apart, he set them apart to be a blessing to the nations of the world. Is that not right? In fact, in the Passover, uh, there was a place left for the stranger to come and set not only Elijah, but, you know, you invite even you know, the Gentile stranger. And the, the Feast of Tabernacles was for all the nations, correct? When we study the feast, but what did Israel do? Israel turned inward to themselves and kept God in the box of Israel instead of taking him to the world like they were supposed to do. Got him in trouble, didn't it? You see, when we do that, we become inward focused, guarantee it. It's always going to get us in trouble. I heard from Pastor uh, Luciano the other day. They're going to be doing their, their, their Christmas thing, and he, he asked us to pray and see if we wanted to be involved in that because they would like to double the families if they could uh, to, uh, to reach during that, that, that giveaway. And what a, what a blessing to be asked. Now we have the choice. Can we become a part of that? I pray we do, but uh, to be outward focused, you guys are praying for 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 Pastor Sadiq. You're 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 praying for Pastor Luciano. You're praying for our new new friends down in Honduras. We have an opportunity to reach out to them. Put those addresses. Get those addresses up again, and you can write them and mail them and get to know them better. But let's not become that sign when you leave. You're now entering the the mission field. That's right. We need to remain outwardly focused. The more we become a post-Christian culture, the more the church has retreated into itself. And we develop kind of a bulk, bulk, bunker mentality or even a monastic mentality. Spiritual, religious, active, but focus on what happens inside the walls of our modern day monasteries, if you will. Now we have three choices. Three choices. Uh, to make, and, and they are critical. So how will it be? Now listen, folks, we can be so outward focused, uh, or we can be inward focused, or we can be balanced. I want you to think of a teeter-totter. <laughs> of all, the, or, or, or most of our emphasis, then, if it's placed on us, 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 us. What can you do for us? Oh, you know, how are you going to meet our needs? That take care of us, do for us, tend for us. Then we lose balance, do we not? We run into the danger of becoming an uncaring for those that are around us who are lost and perish eternally. The end result is that the church ceases to reproduce, and they will dwindle and die from the lack of new life infusion correct? Well, we can go the other way. On the other hand, if, if most or all of our emphasis is on the lost and we pay little attention to the needs of the body, then the opposite result goes into effect. The body suffers and becomes anemic and sickly and dies from the lack of nurture. In physical terms, it's called the failure to thrive. However, God has given us a solution to these two options. And it is maybe the hardest of all. It's called balance. Have you ever tried to, to 
the balance on it. I, I, I often, you know, stand on the, the, the balance ball, you know. It's a half ball with a flat surface and, and it, it's good workout for the core. And I've got one here in the house and, and, and I'll get in my little room where nobody can see me and I'll, you know, stand and I'll work on it and it, it, it strengthens the core. Well, interesting. I have not thought about that as a good image. I need to draw up some pictures and show you what that looks like. How many of you have ever been on a balance ball like that? To where you, you learn. You know, when I first started, you know, you hold on to something and you get your ultimately you're standing on it, you're you're learning you know to balance it and you know, then you start doing you know squats and everything. I get on it. It builds your core. Folks, balance. I thought of that. This is a new thought for me. Pooh! You like that one, huh? Hey, huh? I'm ready. Pooh! Balance builds your core. When there is proper balance between being inward focused, in other words, taking care to nurture and disciple believers in the body, hmm, as of yesterday, an outward focus, so witnessing and reaching and serving a lost in the community and around the world. Well, this balance in essence is called the Great Commission. Jesus said to go out in the world and here's the imperative, make disciples. You heard that yesterday. In other words, multiply me. Make followers of me. Proclaim the gospel. Be my witness. Reach the lost and die. Seek those in need of Christ that they might be saved. Right? Reach them, bring them in, and teach them. Hmm. Outward, inward. John 20 and verse 21 says, As the Father has sent me, even so, in like manner, in the same manner and with the same purpose the Father sent me into the world, I'm sending you into the world as my ambassadors, as my representatives. But the Great Commission also tells us to bring them into union with the body and teach them so they might grow multiply and reproduce. He says, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Then teach them all that Christ has taught you. Paul writes to the church in, in Ephesus, if you remember right, and he says he's given some to be apostles and some to be be, be uh, uh, apostles and, and pastors, and teachers. What? For the equipping of the saints, right? For the work of ministry, balance, until we all attain to the unity of faith, that we no longer be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. It is my considered opinion. <laughs> now I will speak from on high that perhaps the hardest thing for any of us to maintain is this kind of balance. This spiritual equilibrium. How many of you have problems with it? And Janine, it's good to see you. Missed you yesterday because I wasn't there. But it's good to see you this morning. God bless. Anybody else have problems maintaining their spiritual equilibrium? Of course. I'm the only one. In, 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 in all these wonderful folks that are listening, I'm the only one that probably has problems. Uh, oh, thank you, Debbie. Join the club. I do, too. Years ago, 
I would get asked the question, why were you, or, you know, because I'm no longer as involved in chaplaincy as I was, for, uh, you know, several reasons, but one is my plate's pretty full. So I scaled back. Angel, thank you very much. Daniel, definitely so. <laughs> Carolyn, me too. All right. Whew. Well, I was thinking I was, in the, I, was the only one, I was the only one in the bucket here. But, you know, for years that would be asked, well, why are you so involved in chaplaincy? Well, you know, one of the hardest things for, for preachers to do, and, and, and this is probably just a preacher problem, is to get to know and meet and build relationships uh, with non-Christian people. Brenda says, like learning to stand on a balance ball it takes a lot of practice yes it does even holding on to the wall yes it does falling off and getting back on and fighting the discouragement i love that poo yes uh preachers spend most of their time with what type of folk other believers they spend in the Bible preparing, teaching, spending it with believers, enjoying that fellowship time. But that's where, for some, 100% of their time is spent. But, but most of their time is spent well into the 90s, I'm sure, with nothing but believers. Where do preachers get a chance to, to meet and interface with lost? Some younger than me, they get involved in, in coaching, working with, and, and that's a great opportunity to meet. I feel like Tina is learning to walk. That's a good, good example, Angel. Very good example. We're learning to walk, crawl, walk, pull ourselves up, run. Others, you know, can find uh, other methods. I found that involved in chaplaincy put me right in the center of hundreds and hundreds of lost people not only within the departments I worked in but in the community that we served you see we have to maintain this spiritual equilibrium the tension between being inward and, and outward focused and you know those tension you know, things that, that it's it's always that. Where was this assembly of believers in Acts 4? Where are we? Don't we even ask ourselves, are we more inward focused or are we more outward focused or are we balanced in our daily and corporate life? Well, I, I'd like us to take one more glimpse inside this huddle of this church and see what produced for them this incredible balance. So your Bibles are open, Acts 4. You've got your little notepads <clears throat> out there. Let me get a drink. Look at Acts 4. Starting in verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place where they were gathered were shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness and the congregation of those who believed were of one heart and soul and not one of them claimed that anything belonged to him as his own. But all things were common property. And with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. Now, if you think that I added an emphasis in my reading, you'd probably be right. 
I want you to see what is said here. And then we'll take it apart. When they have prayed, the place where they were gathered together was shaken. What does that indicate to you? Well, it ought to indicate to you the glorious presence of God. God stepped down. Okay? And what was the result of God stepping down into this prayer meeting, into this group? They were all filled with the Spirit. And what was the end result of being filled with the Spirit? They began to speak the Word of God with boldness. The very opposite of what they were supposed to do. Another result was that, that they were all together with one heart and one soul. And something sprung out of that. None of them claimed that anything that they had belonged to them. It was their own particular property. But all things were held as common property. And what came out of that great power was given to the apostles. What came out of that filling of the Holy Spirit, apostles were given great power, giving uh, testimony and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for the whole church and everybody around, abundant grace was upon them. Do you see? You might want to take and, and dissect those few verses. Take your, your paper and, 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 and you know, just start taking. You know, what happened after they prayed? The place was shaking. God's presence. And from God's presence, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And then just, so you get a picture. Get yourself into it. Take time to explore it. And then begin to pray through all of those things. You see, I invite you into my my study. I invite you into my quiet time. Here's where we're at. In order to explore, I don't, uh, and don't you imagine any time God steps down, the earth will shake from the impact of his steps? I would think so. Duncan Campbell talks about prayer meetings there on the Isle of Lewis and others where you know, the place where they were praying literally people felt like an, an earthquake that was shaking even to the point that pictures sometimes would fall off the wall or something off the cabinet shelf wouldn't you love to be in a prayer meeting like that I would so let's kind of take this apart and to explore the key to the power and balance of this church, I pose two questions. Beginning, of course, with the very first. What happened when they prayed? What he said? When they prayed, the place where they were gathered was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Remember, flash yourself back to Acts 1.8. After that the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the, end, you know, the ends of the earth. Ah, uh, why did he say they would be filled with the Holy Spirit? that they would be his witnesses. You see, if you really want to experience the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit, become an active witness. You know, let God use you to testify and to witness to other people because that's why he gave you the power of the Holy Spirit. Not so that you could you know, feel good and on this spiritual high and all of these things will happen. It's that we might be his witness that we might speak his word boldly there's an outward demonstration on this occasion where they experience 
a shaking of the place where they were assembled. No, uh, there's not always this kind of physical manifestation like this. So the thing we take away from this event is that when the Spirit of God moves, matter responds, and we may be the matter that is responding. Correct? When God moves upon an individual or group, there is a manifestation of his presence. And what's the most important is the following statement. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Now I'm going to add a word there. You can spell it out with capital letters, A-G-A-I-N. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit again. Why do I say that? Because on the day of Pentecost, when they were in the upper room and they were praying, uh, the place where they were praying, all of a sudden there was the sound of a mighty rushing wind, again a manifestation. And over each of the head of the 120 people that were in that upper room, Dad's cloven tongues as fire it didn't say fire it just says it it, it appeared that, that that speaks of the Shekinah glory of God the presence of God kind of fell on them and they were filled with the Holy Spirit that was the experience of Pentecost so so that this experience of the filling of the Holy Spirit is not a one time for all experience for Peter this counts at least as a third time, if I'm reading scripture, that he was specifically said that he was filled with the Holy Spirit, right? On the day of Pentecost, correct? When he stood before the Sanhedrin, filled with the Holy Spirit, he spoke to them and preached that sermon. And now here, in the presence of the church, he is filled again, along with all of them, with the Holy Spirit. You see, the idea that, the, that we are spirit-filled not only, uh, only at an experience known as the baptism of the Holy Spirit is wrong. Baptism or indwelling of the Holy Spirit is wrong. And in no way is consistent with Scripture. We must be continually being filled with the Holy Spirit and make our immersion in him a constant experience. I'm going to labor this point. We've discussed it several times, but we will look at it again a little bit more so that these things very deep in us and become a part of the very fabric and fiber of our being. I think he's close here and pray. Father, thank you for these moments. God, I thank you that you can open our eyes and our heart and see the incredible power and majesty that are in these few verses. God, we need to understand them deeply, profoundly. We need to pull these truths out, glean them out, and allow your spirit to make them part of the joint and the marrow and the sinew of our life. As we go out today, I pray we go out and seek you to empower us to live a balanced life. Presenting Christ to an open world, but at the same time being built up within the body. God, may you be blessed in our efforts today. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you for being along. Oh, uh, 
Kirk Gussell, could someone please help me get food supplies and diapers for me and my family? Okay. Been there. All right. We love you guys. And I pray that you have a great, precious, wonderful day. God bless. I'll see you tomorrow at night.